Chapter 1. Alec Murray Haver praised the Highland home of which he had so often spoken when far away. Across the wide ocean. The house. Substantially built in a style suited to that clime stood some way up the side of a hill which rose abruptly from the waters of Loch Edith, on the north side of which it was situated. To the west the hills were comparatively low, the shores alternately widening and contracting, and projecting in numerous promontories. The higher grounds were clothed with heath and wood, while level spaces below were diversified by cultivated fields. To the east of the house, up the loch, the scenery assumed a character much more striking and grand. Far as the eye could reach appeared a succession of lofty and barren mountains, rising sheer out of the water, on the calm surface of which their fantastic forms were reflected as in a mirror. Across the loch the lofty summit of Ben Cruachan appeared towering to the sky. The scenery immediately surrounding Murray's domain of Burkeldine was of extreme beauty. At some little distance the hill, rising abruptly, was covered with oak, ash, birch, and alder, producing a rich tone of coloring. The rowan and hawthorn trees mingling their snowy blossoms or coral berries with the foliage of the more gigantic natives of the forest, while the dark purple heath, in tufted wreaths, and numerous wild flowers were interspersed amid the rich sward and underwood along the shore beneath. Behind the house were shrubberies and a well-cultivated kitchen garden, sheltered on either side by a thick belt of pines, while in front a lawn, also protected by shrubberies from the keen winds which blew down from the mountain heights, sloped towards the loch, with a gravel walk leading to the landing place. Murray had added a broad veranda to the front of the house to remind himself and Stella of Don Antonio's residence in Trinidad, where they had first met. Indeed, in some of its features, the scenery recalled to their memories the views they had enjoyed in that lovely island. And though they confessed that Trinidad carried off the palm of beauty, yet they both loved far better their own highland home. It was a lovely summer day, and Stella was sitting in the veranda with a small stranger, whom her faithful black maiden, Polly, had just placed in her lap. She was fully employed in bestowing on him those marks of affection which a loving mother delights in affording to her firstborn. Alec stood by her side, watching her and their child with looks of fond pride. He had just come in from the garden which it was one of his chief occupations to tend, and had taken off his gardening gloves, that he might pat his child's cheek and tickle its chin to make it coo and smile. He might have been excused if he was proud of his boy, for he was a noble little fellow, a broad shield, as he was pronounced to be by his grand aunt, Mistress Tibby McTavish, who had presided at his birth and likely to do no discredit to the name of Murray. The cutter ought to have been back by this time, said Alec at length. Looking at his watch, Archie has had a fair tide from Oban, and a leading wind up the lock. I hope that he has not managed to run the Stella ashore. Ben Snatchblock knows the coast, and he himself should be pretty well acquainted with it. Perhaps Mr. Adair did not arrive at the time expected and Archie would, of course, wait for him, observed Stella. That may be the case, said Alec, taking the telescope from a bracket on the wall, and looking through it down the lock. There is no sail in sight like her, but I see a four-oared boat, which has just passed Buna Ferry, pulling up the lock. Can Adair by any means have missed the cutter, and be making his way alone to us? Quote, Probably she contains a party of tourists on an excursion, said Stella. She is, at all events, steering for Burkeldine, observed Murray. If she does not bring Patty Adair, you will have the opportunity of exhibiting the small Alec to some other visitor. I will go down to the pier to receive him, whoever he is, with due honor. Saying this, Murray, 
having bestowed a kiss on his wife's brow, and given another tickle to his baby's chin, which produced an additional coup of delight, hurried down to the landing place, towards which the boat was rapidly approaching. He had his telescope in his hand. He stopped on the way to take another look through it. It is not Terence. But, who do you think? Our old friend, Admiral Triton. He shouted out, as he looked back to his wife, and then hurried on to the landing place, that he might be there before the Admiral could step ashore. In a few minutes he was receiving the old man's hearty grasp of the hand, as he helped him out of the boat. I had long promised to pay a visit to some friends in the Highlands, and I determined to make a trip a few miles farther and take you by surprise. For I knew that I should be welcome at whatever time I might arrive, said the Admiral. Indeed you are, my dear sir, answered Murray. Most sincerely I say it. We are flattered by your visit. Give me your arm, my boy for I don't walk uphill as easily as I used to do a few years back, said the admiral, leaning somewhat heavily on the young commander as he stumped along with his timber toe. Stay. By the by, I must dismiss my crew, he exclaimed, stopping short. Let them come up to the house first. Admiral, said Murray, they would consider otherwise that we were forgetful of Highland hospitality at Burkeldine. You will find your way up to the kitchen, my lads, by yonder path, he added, turning round to the boatman. The cook will have a snack for you before you pull back to Oban. The men touched their bonnets and gratefully grinned their assent to the laird's proposal as they tumbled out of the boat, while Murray conducted Admiral Triton by the center path, which led through the grounds to the house. Mrs. Murray having deposited the wee Alec in the arms of Polly, stood ready to receive them. I am delighted to see you looking so bright and blooming. My dear Mrs. Murray, exclaimed the old admiral, shaking her warmly by the hand. It shows that the Highland air agrees with you, notwithstanding your long sojourn in the West Indies, except in being more bracing. The climate differs but little from that to which I was accustomed in the north of Ireland till I grew up, and I was scarcely long enough in the West Indies to become acclimatized, answered Stella. And a shade passed over her countenance as she recollected the trying scenes she had gone through during the time to which the Admiral referred. He observed it, and changed the subject, and so you are expecting to see our old shipmate. Terence Adair? He remarked, as he sat himself down in a chair which Murray placed for him. I shall be heartily glad to shake him by the hand again, and to talk over old times. I haven't forgot his making me carry his portmanteau for him. The rogue. And the admiral chuckled and laughed, and told Stella the story while he rubbed his hands. I made him pay, though. He thought he was going to do me out of that but I was too sharp for him. Ha! 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 And he laughed till the tears ran down his cheeks. He was becoming more garrulous than before. Another sign of advancing age, which Murray was sorry to observe. He told many of his old anecdotes, laughing as heartily at them as ever. He was interrupted by the appearance of Polly, who had been watching for an opportunity of introducing the baby which she now brought to its mama. The admiral started up on seeing it. What? I hadn't heard of this small stranger. He exclaimed. Is it a boy or a girl? A fine little creature. At all events, I congratulate you, my dear Mrs. Murray, with all my heart. A sailor's wife is all the better for a few small ones to occupy her thoughts when her, Guidman, as you call him in Scotland, is away from home. Though I suppose you have no intention of letting Murray go to sea again just yet? Quote. I hope not. Indeed, answered Stella, turning pale at the thought. There are numberless officers who have nothing to do on shore. And he has plenty to occupy him. But he ought to take a trip to sea. 
to prevent himself from growing rusty, said the admiral. We want the best officers to command Her Majesty's ships. And he is among them. You will not contradict me on that point? Quote. I am sure he is, said Stella. With a sigh. Then. In case the Admiralty require his services. You will not dissuade him from accepting an appointment? Quote. Oh. Admiral. Are they going to send him to sea? Exclaimed Stella suddenly. Not that I know of, answered the Admiral. I have not been led into their secret intentions. And I don't wish to act the part of a bird of ill omen. Though I confess that, were he to have the offer of a ship, I should advise him to accept it. Stella's lips quivered. She had thought herself very heroic. And that she should be ready to sacrifice her husband for the good of his country. But when it came to the point, she could not bear the idea of parting from him. Alec had gone round to see that the boat's crew were attended to. On coming back, he took another glance through his telescope down the lock. Here comes the Stella. We shall soon have Terence Adair with us. He exclaimed. What brought him home? Asked the Admiral. Surely he went out with Jack Rogers to India? Quote. He got an ugly wound in cutting out a piratical junk in the Indian seas, said Murray. It was a near thing for him. And the doctors insisted on his returning home as the only chance of saving his life. So he wrote me word in a few lines. But he is not much addicted to letter writing. I, therefore, know no particulars. He will give us the account when he arrives. Murray stood watching the cutter. While the admiral continued talking to Stella. The little craft. A vessel of about twelve tons had been built by the young commander soon after he settled at Berkeldine. What naval officer, who has the means in his power, would fail of possessing a vessel of some sort? She was not only a pleasure yacht, but was useful as a dispatch boat to bring the necessary stores for the house from Oban, and served also for fishing in summer and for wildfowl shooting in winter. She was a trim yacht. Notwithstanding her multifarious employments, Ben Snatch Block, who acted as master, with a stout lad as his crew, was justly proud of her. He boasted that nothing under canvas could beat her, either on a wind or going free, and that in heavy weather she was as lively as a duck. Not a better seaboat could be found between the mainland and the Hebrides. Indeed, she had often been pretty severely tried. And on one occasion Murray had had the satisfaction of preserving the crew of a wreck on a dangerous reef. When no other craft was at hand to render them assistance. He had, of course, named his yacht the Stella. For what other name could he have thought of giving her? He now watched her with the interest which every seaman feels for the vessel he owns. As close hauled, she stood up the lock. Now a breeze headed her. And she had to make a couple of tacks or more to weather a point. Now she met a baffling wind. And it seemed impossible that she would do it. Keep her close. Archie. Exclaimed Murray. As if addressing his cousin. Now keep her full again and shoot her up round the point. That will do it. Lad. Capital. Another tack and you will have the wind off the shore. That is only a flaw. Put her about again. With two more tacks you will do it. The breeze freshening and proving steady. In a short time the Stella was near enough to enable Murray to distinguish Terence Adair in another person. In addition to those who had gone away in the yacht. As the jib and foresail were taken off her. She shot up to the buoy. Murray hastened down to the landing place. In time to meet Adair and the stranger whom Archie pulled on shore in the punt. Adair sprang to land with much more agility than the old admiral had exhibited, and was warmly greeted by Murray. As you told me that Archie was staying with you, I brought that broth of a boy, my nephew, Gerald Desmond, to bear him company and to help keep him out of mischief, exclaimed Adair, turning round and pointing to his nephew 
Hu hung back till his uncle had offered some explanation as to the cause of his appearance. Uninvited. Desmond. You have grown such a strapping fellow that I didn't recognize you, said Murray. Putting out his hand. You are welcome to Burkle Dine. And we can easily stow you away in some odd corner or other. Notwithstanding your inches. Will you come up to the house with us? Or will you wait for Archie? Quote. I will wait for Archie. Sir. Thank you, answered Gerald. And Murray and Adair walked on. We have had sad times at Ballymackery, said the latter. Speaking in a much graver tone than usual for him. Gerald only arrived a couple of weeks ago. Although he has grown so much. The climate of the China Seas has played havoc with his constitution. And I didn't like to leave him in a house of mourning. His mother died while he was away. And my poor sister Kathleen caught cold. And went off in a rapid consumption a few days after he arrived. Your sister Kathleen. To whom Rogers was engaged. Exclaimed Murray. I am truly sorry to hear it. What a blow for him. Too. Poor fellow. You said nothing about this in your letter. Though I saw that you were in mourning. Faith. I hadn't the heart to do so, answered Terence. I knew that I'd have to tell you all about it. And so I thought it better just to ask the question whether I might come and see you. Without saying more. Knowing very surely what your answer would be. If I didn't get it. Which I didn't. Seeing I left home before it arrived. But I suppose it's all right. As Archie said that you were expecting me? Quote. Of course. My dear fellow, said Murray. Poor Jack. Have you written to him? Quote. No. But Kathleen did. While she had strength to hold a pen. And her mother put in a few words to tell him that all was over. On my life. I couldn't have done it. Things have gone badly. Too. At Ballymackery in other respects. The old place must go. After all. And it will break my father's heart. I am very certain. If we had had a good rattling war. And I had picked up lots of prize money. I might have saved it. But that is not to be thought of. And then. My dear Murray. A little private affair of my own. Which has put me out sadly. I wrote. When I first came home. To Lady Rogers. Asking leave to pay a visit at Halliburton Hall. I got an answer from Sir John. Very kind and very polite. At the same time. He gave me to understand that he considered it better I should not make my appearance there. In other words. That I wasn't wanted. I fancied that Lucy had begun to care for me. And so Jack thought. I suspect. From what he said when I confessed to him that I was over head and ears in love with his sweet. Little sister. And had for her sake kept my heart intact. Notwithstanding the fascinations of all the charming creatures we met with in the West Indies. So in truth. Murray. I am about as miserable a fellow as any in the three kingdoms just now. I am very sorry to hear what you tell me, answered Alec. We will do our best to cheer you up. And our old friend, Admiral Triton, who arrived a couple of hours ago, will, I am very sure, lend a hand in the good work. Terence, having unloaded his heart of his griefs, had considerably regained his usual spirits by the time he had got up to the house, and had shaken hands with Stella and the Admiral, while he was talking to the latter. Murray hinted to his wife not to ask questions about his family or the Rogers. Telling her briefly what had occurred. The Admiral immediately attacked Terence about the old story of the portmanteau. And that led him into a whole series of yarns. Laughing so heartily himself at them. That Adair was compelled to laugh also. You must give me a cruise in the Stella tomorrow. Murray, he said. She will be far the best style of locomotion for me. For these mountains of yours don't suit me. And yet I should like to see something of the magnificent scenery surrounding you. The proposal. Was at once agreed to. And Stella said that she should like to go also. 
Archie and Desmond now arrived and paid their respects to the Admiral. Desmond was introduced in due form to the young heir of Burkledine. Faith. Mrs. Murray. He'll be after making a fine young midshipman one of these days, said Gerald. Patting the baby's cheek. Won't you just let Archie and me take him to sea with us next time we go afloat? We'll watch over him as carefully as any she nurse can do on shore. And teach him all manner of tricks. I dare say you would, said Stella, laughing. His nautical experiences must be confined at present to a cruise on board the yacht now and then. In fine weather. Though I don't forget the good care you took of Master Spider on board the Supplejack. By the by, what became of your pet? May I ask? Quote. Tom Rogers and I took him with us on board the Niobe. He was making immense strides in civilization, having taken to sleeping in a hammock under bedclothes, and learned to drink tea in a teacup, when he was lost at sea in a gale of wind rounding the Cape. Tom tried to write a poem to his memory, but broke down, declaring that his feelings overcame him, though in truth he couldn't manage to make even the two first lines rhyme so that that might have had something to do in the matter. While Gerald was rattling on, Archie produced the letter bag, which he had hitherto forgotten to give to Commander Murray. It contained several letters for him, as also others forwarded by his Navy agent to Lieutenant Adair. Among them were two long, official-looking dispatches, with the words, On Her Majesty's Service, printed outside. Murray looked somewhat grave as he read his. At the same time, an expression arising from gratified pride appeared on his countenance. Terence tore his letter open. They don't intend to let me rest on shore. At all events, I expected to have my promotion. However, but instead, their lordships send me off to sea again. I am appointed to the Opal. Just commissioned at Portsmouth. As first lieutenant. I ought to be highly flattered. And, Desmond, my boy, you are to go with me. The best thing that could happen to you. I congratulate you, said the Admiral. And what news does your dispatch contain? He continued, to Murray. Without answering, Alec put the letter into the Admiral's hands. And, taking his wife's arm, led her into the garden, where they were concealed from sight by the shrubbery. It will be a blow to her, said the admiral, as he glanced over the official document. Still it is flattering to Murray. And, unless he has resolved to give up the service altogether, I could not wish him better luck. You and your old shipmate are not to be parted. Adair. He is appointed to the command of the Opal. And I have a notion that she will be stationed at the Cape. And probably sent to the east coast of Africa where there is work to be done, and prize money to be picked up, not to be got every day in these piping times of peace. It is no easy matter, however, to catch those slippery Arab slavers, so you mustn't count your hens before they are hatched. Still, the opal is a fast craft, and if any man can do what is to be done, Murray will do it, at all events. I am delighted to hear that I am to serve with him. I was anxious to be off to sea as soon as possible. And it makes amends to me for my disappointment in not getting my promotion. I say, Archie, I suppose that you will be appointed to the same craft? exclaimed Desmond. Nay doot about it. Mon, answered Archie. I've a notion it's the doing of our cousin. Admiral McAlpine who returned home not long ago from the West Indies, and would of course have been looking after our interests. For he is a very kind man. I suspect that Mrs. Murray considers it a very cruel kindness, observed the Admiral. But every sailor's wife must be prepared to be parted from her husband. And to make the most of him when he is on shore. He is a lucky fellow who has got a wife to be parted from, said Terence thinking of Lucy. At all events, when he is away, he can look forward to the happiness of being again united to her. 
instead of having to come home, as is the lot of some of us, without anyone who cares for him to give him a welcome. So the favors of heaven are very fairly divided. And in my opinion Murray has the best of it, though it may give him and his wife a severe pang to part from each other. Here they come, and we shall learn how they have settled the matter, observed the admiral. But as duty has ever been my friend Murray's guiding star, I am very sure that he will not allow his inclination to prevent him from acting as he thinks right. And, unless I am mistaken as to his wife's character, she will not utter a word to prevent him. No one would have supposed from the countenances of Alec and Stella how much their hearts were agitated. I am sorry, Admiral. We must give up our projected cruise for tomorrow, and cut yours and Adair's visit short, as we shall have much to do in preparing to leave Burkledine. Though I must beg you to stay as long as we remain, said Alec. Quite calmly, we must treat you without ceremony. And I know, Adair, that you and Desmond will lend a hand in setting things in order for our departure. Then you have made your mind up to accept the command of the Opal, said the Admiral. I said it would be so. I was sure of it. I must compliment Mrs. Murray. For there are some wives. Who don't love their husbands a jot the better. Who would have turned the scale the other way. Duty. My lads. Duty should carry everything before it, continued the Admiral. Turning to the midshipmen. Learn a lesson from your superiors and never let anything induce you to swerve from duty. Quote. Murray, of course, had an immense amount of work to get through. It was at once settled that Stella should accompany him to Portsmouth, and should take up her residence in the neighborhood during his absence. Berkeldine was to be let, and a tenant had to be found. Arrangements made with the factor and grieve, and other retainers. Various articles to be stored up, and others to be carried with them. The Stella to be laid up, and the horses to be sold. A couple of days thus passed rapidly away, and, all working with a will, the party were ready to start. The rays of the sun, just rising above the lofty summits of the hills, glanced down the lock as they assembled on the landing place with their dependents and every cotter on the estate from far and near, who had come to bid them farewell. Many a tear was shed by the females of the family, as Mrs. Murray, the baby and Polly, with the gentlemen of the party, embarked on board the Stella, which was to convey them to Oban. The men waved their bonnets, and uttered a prayer in Gaelic that the laird and his good wife and the bairn might be brought back to them in safety. Sail was made, and the little craft glided away from her moorings with a fair breeze down the lock. Mrs. Murray looked with fond regret at the lovely home she was leaving, though no longer the home it had been to her without her husband. The Admiral, of course, did his best to keep up her spirits, and whatever Alec might have felt, he was as cheerful as if they were merely making a day's excursion. The scenery around the home he loved so well looked even more attractive than ever. On the port hand Ben Cruachin rose proudly amid the assemblage of craggy heights which extended to the eastward along the shores of the loch. The ruins of Archatton Priory, covered with luxuriant ivy, and ore canopied by lofty trees, soon came in sight on the starboard side. The monks of old wise in their generation, chose pleasant places for their residences, observed the admiral, pointing to the ruins. They must have been of great benefit to the surrounding population in those turbulent times, said Mrs. Murray. I have sometimes thought that it would be well if they still existed in districts where no landed proprietors live to look after the people. Very well in theory, my dear madam, said the admiral. But we must take into consideration what human nature really is. Monks in many instances proved themselves to be errant knaves. And among every assemblage of mortals such will ever be found in time to leaven the whole mass. 
these and friaries and convents were not abolished a day too soon. And advanced as the present generation esteems itself. I am very sure that if we were to shut up a dozen men together, picked from among the most learned and enlightened students at our universities, or the same number of the most charming women to be found, and insist on their living as celibates to the end of their days, and devoting themselves to a certain routine of strict forms and ceremonies, they would very soon come to loggerheads and do more harm to themselves and others than they could possibly do good. The wisest men in all the nations of Europe have seen the necessity of abolishing the conventual system. And I cannot suppose that English men and women are more likely to be holy and immaculate than the people of other countries. The whole thing is an illusion. And I am very sure that the system, if, as according to the wishes of some, it should again prevail in England, would only tend to the corruption of those who are beguiled by it, and to the dishonor of true religion. You are right, Admiral, and certainly my wife does not advocate the re-establishment of monasteries in this country, remarked Alec. Oh no, no, I was thinking rather of the past, said Stella, and probably if we could look into the interior of convents in their best days, we should see much to grieve and shock us. The tide was on the ebb, and as the cutter passed through the narrows at Connell Ferry, she pitched and tossed in the turbulent current, here forming a perfect race, in a way which put a stop to further conversation. The breeze being steady, she, however, with Murray's skillful handling, ran through and glided forward on her course. Now Dunstaffnage Castle, standing on a slight elevation near the shore, came in sight, a picturesque ruin, its high walls and round towers rising boldly against the sky. Farther on appeared Dunnelly Castle, an ivy-clad, square keep, in former times the seat of the MacDougalls of Lorne, and now the cutter entered the Bay of Oban with the long island of Carrera on the right, and brought up amid a fleet of small craft and coasters. A steamer on her way to Glasgow was waiting for passengers, and the party had just time to get on board before she began paddling on to the southward. You will take good care of the craft. Dougal, said Ben Snatch Block, as he handed over his command to the old Highland skipper, into whose charge Murray had given the yacht. Cover her over carefully, and keep the sun from her in summer and the snow in winter. And we'll have many a cruise in her yet when we come back from the East Indies. Dinna fash ye, mon. She'll no take harm under my charge, said Dougal. Dougal has been somewhat jealous of Ben on account of his having been appointed to the yacht. Instead of himself, remarked Alec. Glasgow was reached before nightfall and the next morning the whole party started by train for the south. Admiral Triton insisted on accompanying his friends to Portsmouth. My sister Deborah and I have taken a house on South Sea Common for three years. And you and your wife and bairn must be our guests. And we have a room for Archie till it is time for him to take up his berth on board. You will cheer us up. And we old people want companionship for I can't get about as I once did. And the young fellows fight shy of me and don't laugh at my yarns. As you and Jack used to do. And I say, Murray, if you want to do me a favor, you will let your wife stay on as our guest the boy will be a great amusement to us both. We'll not spoil him. Depend on that. I then can come and go as I like. And when I am away, She'll help to keep my good sister alive and cheerful. When Deb hasn't me to look after, she's apt to get out of spirits and to be thinking about her own ailments. Fancied more than real, for she is as hearty as she can expect to be at her age. While, if she has a guest and a little child to occupy her thoughts, she'll be perfectly happy and contented. So, you see, You'll be doing her and me the greatest possible favor. Don't say no, but settle the matter at once. Murray, 
of course, thanked the admiral very heartily. He was sure that the invitation was given from the kindest of motives. And he fully believed that Stella would contribute greatly to the happiness of the old man and his sister, who, without kith or kin, required someone to solace them in their declining years. He seemed truly grateful when Murray, after talking the matter over with Stella, accepted his kind proposal. She mustn't consider herself a mere visitor, but must be as much at home as if Deb were only her housekeeper. That is just what Deb will like. And I must be looked upon as their visitor when I come back from paying a visit to any of my friends who are still willing to receive me. Though the only people on whom I can now depend to give me a hearty welcome are Sir John and Lady Rogers. They don't get tired of my yarns. And Sir John laughs at them as heartily as he did many a long year ago. So the matter was settled. And on reaching Portsmouth, Murray and Stella accompanied the Admiral to his very comfortable house at South Sea, at the entrance door of which Mrs. Deborah Triton, she had taken brevet rank, stood with smiling countenance ready to receive them. It overlooked Spithead and the Isle of Wight, with the Solent stretching away to the westward, the entrance to Portsmouth Harbour with steamers and vessels of all sizes running constantly in and out, being seen at no great distance off across the common. But Sister Deb, as the Admiral generally called her, is more worthy of a description than the house. She was remarkably like her brother, except that she had two feet, whereas he lacked one, and that her still plump face was free from the weather-beaten stains contracted by his honest countenance during his days afloat. Her figure was short and round, exhibiting freedom from care. It was such, indeed, as only a good-natured person could possess. But her face was the index of her mind and heart. That bore an unmistakable expression of kindness, gentleness, and good temper, which perfect faith in the simple truths of Christianity could alone give. Murray felt perfectly confident that his wife and child would be in good keeping during his absence, and his heart felt lightened of one of its chief cares. Next morning, Murray, accompanied by Archie, went on board the Opal, which, having just been brought out of dock, lay alongside the hulk. She was still in the hands of the riggers, who, busy as bees, swarmed in every part rattling down the rigging, swaying up the topmasts, and getting the yards across. Her appearance in that condition was not attractive. But as he surveyed her with a seaman's eye, he felt satisfied that she was a fast craft, and well calculated for the service on which she was to be sent. I have no wish to command a steamer, but I cannot help fancying that a pair of paddles would be more likely to catch the Arab dows we or to go in search of than is the fastest craft under canvas, he observed to Adair, whom he found on board. They at once set to work to collect a crew, in which business Ben Snatchblock was especially active. Ben a few days afterwards received, to his satisfaction, his warrant as boatswain, his zeal being considerably enlivened thereby. He, before long, managed to pick up a number of prime hands from among his old shipmates, on whom he could thoroughly depend. The gunner and carpenter joined the same day he got his warrant. The former, Timothy Ebbs, was a little man, but he had a big voice and a prodigious pair of black whiskers, which, sticking out on either side of his face, gave him a sufficiently ferocious aspect to inspire shipboys and other young members of the crew, with the necessary amount of awe, while the able seamen respected him for his tried courage and undoubted nautical experience. Adair was very glad to find that Yosh Green was appointed as master, as he had known him well when he was second master of the Tudor, in the West Indies, and a more merry, kind-hearted, better disposed fellow never stepped. Yosh, it was said, never went anywhere without finding friends. 
or came away without having made fresh ones. Adair, Archie, and Gerald, with all the officers who had as yet been appointed to the corvette, took up their quarters on board, and the work of fitting out made rapid progress. I wonder whom we shall have for our second lieutenant, said Gerald, as they were sitting in the berth. An old shipmate or a new one? I hope we may get a good sort of a fellow. I should like to have old Higson. What a good-natured chap he was. Quote. That was when he was first promoted. He may have grown rusty by this time. At not getting another step, observed Archie. He is older than the captain. And yet junior to Mr. Adair. On going on deck soon afterwards, an officer came up the side. Who introduced himself to Terence as Lieutenant Frank Mildmay. Come to join the Opal as second lieutenant. No two persons could be more dissimilar than the first and second lieutenants of the corvette. He had a smooth face with pink cheeks, whiskers curled to a nicety, and hair carefully brushed. His figure was slight and refined, and he wore lilac kid gloves, his appearance being certainly somewhat effeminate. Indeed, he looked as if he had just come out of a bandbox. He'll never set the Thames on fire, observed Paddy Desmond to Archie. Faith. The men will be after calling him Mr. Mildman. Unless he condescends to dip those delicate paws of his into the tar bucket. The men probably looked on their second lieutenant with much the same feelings as did the two midshipmen. While he, regardless of what they thought of him, accompanied Adair into the gunroom to make himself acquainted with the rest of his messmates. The remainder of the gunroom officers and midshipmen joined the next day. And, the complement of the crew being made up, the corvette, casting off from the hulk, took up her moorings in the middle of the harbor. Of the newcomers, two small midshipmen, who had never before been to sea, Paddy Desmond immediately designated one, Billy Blueblazes, in consequence of his boasting that he was related to an admiral of that name. While the other was allowed to retain his proper appellation of Dickie Duff, Paddy declaring that it required no reformation. An old mate who was always grumbling, and two young one who had just passed their examination, with an assistant surgeon, two clerks and a master's assistant, made up the mess, and pretty closely stowed they were in the narrow confines of the berth. The only other person worthy of note was the third warrant officer, the carpenter, who rejoiced in the designation of Caractacus Chessel, the name of the British hero having been bestowed on him by his father, who had once on a time been a stage player. He was as tall and bulky as the gunner was short and wiry. Indeed, the three warrant officers formed a strange contrast with each other. Murray frequently came on board to see how things were getting on, but never interfered with Adair's arrangements. He was sometimes accompanied by Admiral Triton, who seemed to take almost as much interest as he did in fitting out the ship. The sails were now bent and Murray waited in daily expectation of receiving his sailing orders. Meantime, the kind admiral and his sister were moved with the thoughts of poor Stella's approaching bereavement, and, knowing nothing of Adair's attachment, he got Deb to write to Lady Rogers, inviting one of her daughters to pay them a visit, and assist in taking care of Mrs. Murray. As it happened, he said nothing of the first lieutenant of the Opal, and Sir John and her ladyship, supposing that Adair was at Ballymackery, made no objection to Lucis accepting the invitation. She accordingly, much to Murray's satisfaction, arrived the very day the ship was ready for sea. It so fell out that Adair, who had managed to escape from his multifarious duties, and was not aware of her coming, called to pay a farewell visit at the house. He was ushered into the drawing room, where a lady was seated with a book in her hand, though her eyes were oftener cast over the blue ocean than at its pages. The servant announced his name. The lady rose from her seat, 
and gazed at him with a look in which surprise was mingled with pleasure. A rich blush suffusing her countenance. Mr. Adair, she exclaimed, holding out her hand, which Terence took, and seemed very unwilling to relinquish. Nor did she withdraw it. I thought you were at Ballymackery, she said. I was very sorry that Papa thought it right not to accept your proposal to pay us a visit at Halliburton while Jack was absent. But, believe me, he did not intend to be unkind. I felt that, though it made me very unhappy, answered Terence. But did you wish me to come? Quote. Yes, said Lucy. I should have been very glad to see you. I should not be speaking the truth if I did not say so. Then, if I get my promotion and come back with lots of prize money, may I hope, quote, pray don't speak about that, answered Lucy, growing agitated. I can make no promise without Papa's sanction, and I have already said enough to show that I am not indifferent to you. Terence was an Irishman, and Irishmen are not wont to be bashful. But at that moment Alec and Stella entered the room, not failing to remark the confusion their appearance created. Terence, of course, explained that he had called, not expecting to see Miss Rogers, but had come to pay his respects to Mrs. Murray. She tried to send her husband out of the room, intending to follow, but he would not take the hint. And Terence, who had but a short time to spare, was compelled at length to pay his adieu without eliciting the promise he wished from Lucy. She looked very sorry when he had gone, but probably was the better able, from sympathy, to afford consolation to poor Stella. When the moment for her parting with her husband arrived, that moment came the very next day. It need not be dwelt on. Stella's lot was that which numberless wives of naval officers have to endure. But, though widely shared, her grief was not the less poignant as she watched with tearful eyes through the admiral's spyglass the corvette under all sail standing down the Solent.